Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. Alexa, play something soothing. The station, relaxing piano radio on Amazon Music. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. Oh, Cam, I'm so tranquil now. Thanks for that. Right? So when I'm watching the movie, My Spy, uh, the other night, there's oh. a part where David Bautista, and I'm calling him David. I'm going very formal there. Dave Bautista. Oh, oh Davey, boy. <laughs> big, yeah. big D. What's going on, Big D? <laughs> yeah. uh, but Dave Bautista says, you know, Alexa, play something soothing. And um, it set off my Alexa in both my room and my living room. <laughs> did it play anything soothing on there? Yeah, yeah, it did, yeah. On both of them, it started playing music, so I had to turn them both off. I mean, this, and we'll get into the film in a second, but like this film is not only littered with that, but there is a ton of product placement in this film. Scott, I can't talk right now. I'm eating some delicious Oreos. Um, Oh, I'm I'm eating a packet of Doritos right now. Can't you tell? (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The packet is also facing the camera, so you can see the label. I mean, nothing goes down better than Mm. a nice Oreo and milk at the end of a hard day. Yeah, unless you want some Doritos too. Mm, I mean, the crunch. And you can get them at your local Kroger or Costco or, or yeah, anything like that, really. Although I will say, Scott, um, given the state of most movies nowadays, I guess two obnoxious product placements is probably pretty conservative. That's actually pretty good. I mean, to be fair, we still work a product placement into every episode in the midpoint. That's true. And, but if you turn on like a Michael Bay movie, for example, mm. it'll just be wall to wall throughout the entire thing. That's largely how he pays for his movies. Uh, there's these huge cuts, obviously, the studio gets by just like filling a Transformers movie full of product placements. Uh, so this was actually pretty uh, tolerable. Well, it's, it's in the spy movie DNA going back to the Bond films like they were putting product placement in the 60s. That felt cooler somehow. Smirnoff Vodka, I think, was the first one, wasn't it? Didn't that somehow... Oh, there's also the champagne, I think, as well. Could that, be. Uh, Bollinger? Bollinger. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That was very common. But, I mean, that felt classy. Whereas, like, I don't know, characters eating Doritos and facing the bag to the camera doesn't feel quite as classy. Not not quite so much. But, you know, it does sort of fit the character that was eating the Doritos. But we are getting way, way ahead of ourselves. We need to introduce the film, Cam. What are we talking about? We are talking about 2020's My Spy, starring Mr. David Bautista. <laughs> Big D. Go call him Big D for the rest of this episode. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think he probably enjoyed that too, to be fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one that uh, has been on our list for a long time. It's recently, very recently had a sequel that came out and, and no one spoke about it. That's right. That's why we are actually talking about My Spy, because we realized... Less so My Spy, but we realized My Spy Part 2, I can't remember the name of it, Emerald City or something like that, That's right. is going to be forgotten yesterday. So we need mm-hmm. to cover it soon. Yeah, and, and I heard some mildly good things about My Spy. I went in quite positive, quite optimistic. And uh, if you haven't explored My Spy, mm. here is your synopsis. And much like Dave Bautista's co-star Chloe Coleman, this one's also very short. Oh, okay. How refreshing. My spy, almost totally in control. A wait, hardened... wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I was hoping the rest of it would like fill out why they're saying that, but almost totally in control. I guess, I guess Batista's not particularly in control. Okay, and so they're saying she's in control. I think so. Okay. Or the baddie is, or the fish is. Who knows? If you are marketing a movie to like children, is that the best tagline? No, but then also like the poster has Dave Bautista with a a, a kid's um like band aid like plaster on it band aid yeah that's what you guys call it up there um yeah and I don't think that ever happens to him in the film no it doesn't they yeah. were like uh, they were reaching for I I would suspect that there was not a ton of money put into their marketing no especially given when this came out which we will get into but people are, have been left with bated breath I haven't finished my mm. synopsis yes. Almost totally in control, a hardened CIA operative finds himself at the mercy of a precocious nine-year-old girl, having been sent undercover to surveil her family. Yeah, I mean, sure, that's, that's I'm, sure, I'm sure that was like what they pitched when they were in the room. Um, 
Good use of the word surveil, by the way. Nice to see. Yeah, yeah. Although I wouldn't really say hardened CIA operative. I mean, that's... Good. No, they make, a, they make a point to say how bad he is. Yeah, right. he's new to the CIA, really. He's a uh, hardened former Special Forces uh, operative, but uh, he's not a CIA operative who's hardened yet. No. Uh, and nor does he become one? No, no. Uh, he has, you know, he's like a hard outer shell with a gooey center. Just like us. Actually, That's no, we right. have a soft outer shell with a gooey center. We're just, we're like the blob. We're just like... We're, we're just chocolate in a microwave, let's face it. <laughs> we are bubbling on a sidewalk <laughs> in the sun. <laughs> being, being scraped off by the bin men. <laughs> exactly. Mm. We are the ice cream that's been plastered to the side of an elevator. <laughs> it's like go, grown like some green mold on top and has been forgotten about. <laughs> and people can't even be bothered cleaning it up. They just look at it shake their heads sadly and walk away <laughs> spit on it a little bit and just uh really really like maybe stamp it in a little bit and rub it in a bit more yeah thanks thanks people and people look at it and go well i'm sure it was delicious once yeah once they they had they had they had one good day maybe mm. 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 but you know it's um a lot of good things going into this i mean i'm a big wrestling fan so uh seeing dave batista in a film is usually a good set up for me someone i can look to and and see how he's doing um I, i've been watching his career quite uh sort of passionately really since he started acting and i've been really impressed with what he's done well can you talk about about him as a wrestler because i sure. don't have any of that context so you know when he signed on to do like guardians of the galaxy for example mm -hmm. they were like oh you know former wrestler and i'm like okay but it means nothing i think actually the first time i saw him might have been in man with the iron fists maybe okay um but um yeah like i didn't know anything about him so could you just talk a little bit about his wrestling career sure i mean it, it, he didn't have the longest wrestling career he came out of the same um school uh that produced uh john cena that uh, produced brock lesnar mm -hmm. they all basically were in the same class together and um he was a, a former bodybuilder uh, i think i think he may have played football at some point as well a uh, mixed martial artist as well. And he basically just was jacked. That was his gimmick. He was huge. Like, yeah. Huge muscles. That was his, He was the Lothiathon, Dave Batista, and then Batista eventually. Although he, he was introduced as a deacon in sort of a pastoral gimmick for a little while, but they got rid of that. Oh, wow. Okay. He, he, was, the, he was the deacon Batista. It had like a, a dog collar, like a literal dog collar instead of the white collar. It was very odd. And and he like he had his sleeves off. Why would he be wearing a dog collar if he's like a pastor? I don't know. Oh, you mean like the like the the priest kind of collar? You well, mean? I, that's what I think they were referencing. But he was wearing a genuine dog collar instead. Oh, it was very odd. It didn't last very long. That sounds like a, a mixed metaphor. Yeah, they got they kind of got rid of it and repackaged him as like just a beast who like. And he was he was basically introduced into the WWF. Maybe at the time, no, WWE most likely, uh, as part of a stable called um, Evolution, which featured Ric Flair, Triple H, him, and Randy Orton. And it was about like the future and the past of wrestling. And they were basically like running the company for a year or so. And that really catapulted him into the main event. And, you know, he spent a good few years on top um, and then uh, eventually left and wanted to pursue acting, came back for a little bit, and then left again. And I think that's about the time he bagged Guardians of the Galaxy. And the rest is history, really. But he was a multi-time world champion and stuff. Like, he did he did really well. Okay, that was going to be my question, because, like, when I, I don't know that much about wrestling. Mm -hmm. So when I think of, like, the top-tier guys, it's like Hulk Hogan, The Rock, John Cena, people like that. Would he have been up, like, in very high rankings? He never, he never had the cultural penetration of someone like Hulk Hogan or The Rock. Yeah. But like, if there was a tier below that, sure, then he was probably in it at, at that time in like the early two thousands to like twenty ten, twenty twelve, thirteen, fourteen, maybe that was his time. Like million dollar man. Sure. Well, a million dollar man is still going. Like he, he's had a quite a legacy and, what? and always. Yeah. He's not dead. <laughs> no, Ted DiBiase is still going. How he's got to be like ninety-seven years old. <laughs> no, no, he's not actually that old. Um, but yeah, the million-dollar belt is still around. Uh, comes out from time to time. Yeah, everyone's got a price. Everyone's gonna pay. Wow, I'm yeah. absolutely shocked that man is still around. <laughs> I mean, yeah, his son became a wrestler and didn't do very well. Uh, yeah, quite a story. Um, but yeah, but Dave Batista, like, it, he was the, he was the one 
because uh, quite a few wrestlers that have made the jump from wrestling to film hulk hogan being one you you reference but also the rock uh john cena um there's been a couple other ones that have tried but they were the main four really yeah there's been a few that dabbled and but never really crossed over um mm. yeah but yeah like he was the one i was quite keen to see what he would do because he he made the he took the odd jobs the oh. odd choices you know he obviously turned up inspector as as hinks um as a villain there but you know he was doing guardians he did you know uh blade runner 2048 and like, he did actual acting roles whereas you would often see like the rock doing the tooth fairy and john cena doing I don't know, probably a sequel to The Tooth Fairy. Well, John Cena's done a lot of comedy. That's what he, he got really good at, yeah. Yeah, and he he's kind of gone that way, and I like where John's gone. I don't really like where The Rock's gone. Hulk Hogan, can, yeah, I've got some unkind words about him. Mm. But I think Dave Bautista's been the most interesting career post-wrestling. Yeah, I would agree, because I was also thinking, like, what other wrestlers went into acting? I know Goldberg did for a little bit. Um, Randy Orton, CM Punk. Um, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin the did Miz. a few things. Um, yeah. uh, Triple H was in Blade 3. Uh, yeah, and and some other really bad films, yeah, that WWE paid for. Typically, like, kind of generic action movies. Kane um, did See No Evil. Oh, yeah, and uh, Hornswoggle did Leprechaun Origins. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a that's a moment in time right there. I remember those. Uh, I remember them trying to plug that on television. That was a that was a hard one. Yeah, a lot of these are terrible movies that people have mm-hmm. frankly not even really heard of. Do not do not track them down. But Dave Bautista has had an interesting career, and you know I think Guardians was really his coming out party. Yeah, um, and that was I mean Drax was a character designed for him, and, and I know he's tried to like backpedal a little bit and say like he wants to carve his own path but i i i say own it brother like you did a good job with drax you got in a bunch of avengers films and three guardians films and and just own it yeah i mean he's now i think 55 years old um mm. and he's recently like dropped a lot of muscle a ton of weight yeah, yeah and wants to just focus more on acting now so i mean all the power to him but uh i mean i saw him in a knock at the cabin uh the mm-hmm. m night Shyamalan film which it was okay it had some strengths, but um, he was fantastic and really carries that entire movie uh, on his shoulders. So I think he's capable of giving great performances. I'll be curious how it you know shapes up for him in the future. Yeah, and uh, you know all the power to him for for betting on himself and uh, giving it a try. Because a lot of wrestlers will go out and try and do that or try and do something different, TV maybe that sort of stuff or or other endeavors music for instance and then it won't go the way they want and they'll come crawling back to wrestling and that's not necessarily a bad thing you know you tried and you failed that's fine um but like a lot of people will like try and burn bridges on the way out and then come crawling back you know well i remember when he was cast as uh, drax the destroyer and drax is a character i was very familiar with from reading silver server uh comics like all Uh of my young years and so when they cast him i was like oh (laughs) <laughs> it was like former wrestler and you know a uh, guy who was in man in, with the iron fists i'm like oh yeah. well that's not that exciting and then you know i wouldn't have known this but then you go into the movie and they're like we've hired this you know former wrestler to play the character that's like the comedy relief largely and mm-hmm. also d- depends entirely on vocal delivery not something you typically hire wrestlers for but he was like such a you know multi threat there because he could do all the physical stuff and he was also brilliant at the comedy. Oh, it, it's a it's a great proving ground for for comedy and improv. It, it's it's professional wrestling because a lot of it is is adaptive. Like you have to just pivot in any given moment. Um, and in terms of like you know acting, it, the whole thing is pantomime. The whole thing is acting. So a lot of wrestlers find it quite easy to make the transition, but a lot of the time they just don't get the roles to necessarily flourish. Yeah. Um, and so often you get a lot of generic stuff like The Rock and Hulk Hogan, but I, I appreciate it when actors do weird choices like John Cena with Peacemaker or, you know, Drax with Dave Bautista. Well, Bautista feels in some ways like he's taking a page from the Schwarzenegger playbook, mm-hmm. which is he does the roles that get him a lot of attention. You know, obviously Drax got him a lot, but likes to work with interesting people. Yeah. And in unconventional ways. Like Schwarzenegger, people will say, well, he just made 80s action movies. But he was working with James Cameron. He was working with Paul Verhoeven. These were people that were like molding what he could do into really interesting projects. And you'll see Dave Bautista, you know, showing up in, uh, you know, the second Knives Out film, you know, because he wants to work with Ryan Johnson. He will work with interesting directors. You know, you mentioned Blade Runner 2049. 
that's another example. It's like he's he's always looking for directors who are interesting and being obviously very appealing to those directors. Look at Denis Villeneuve with Dune. I was going to say, well, that was that was Blade Runner as well, was Denis Villeneuve. And you yeah. know, he came back as Raban, uh, and that's perfect casting for yeah. Raban. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think he was great in that role. And um, again, it's sort of a... Like it almost feels like Denis was taking a bit of a chance on him because you could have got a quite a named actor in that point. Not that Dave isn't a named actor, and we're kind of spiraling away from my spy. So I'll bring us back in a second. But just I think it interest it's interesting seeing the trajectory of his career. He just brought a new film out with Sofia Batello. I don't know much about it. Yeah. Um. But like that's what's caused him to drop all the ru- the weight. So maybe that'll get him some different roles because he was really kind of known as the big guy. Well, and you look at Spectre, right, where he's cast mm. as the villain, and, or as the henchman. Um, Mr. Hinks, and that's cast at a different time period for Bond. If he's cast in the 1980s in a Roger Moore film, they're like, yeah, we just need a muscle guy. That's all yeah. we need. But when you get to the more modern Craig films, they're looking for actors. Mm-hmm. He's showing up in the Bond film that uh, is coming right after Javier Bardem as your villain, yeah. and now you've got Dave Bautista and Christoph Waltz, but Dave Bautista has to carry a lot of the screen time because Christoph Waltz mm-hmm. is more around the periphery of Spectre. He, he doesn't get much time in it, but he, the bit he's in is is quite full of emotion and, and, and drama. He, he does a lot with a very short scene, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but let's get back to, to my spy. And we can talk a bit more about Dave Bautista and his performance in this film in, in a minute. But I'm sure there is a story here. So how on earth did we get my spy? There's always a story, Scott. Always a story. <laughs> Give it to me. So this was uh, made by STX Entertainment. And they're kind of a fledgling studio. Um, they've been around for a while, but they tend to work in lower budgets. Mm-hmm. And they have wanted to focus on cranking out some low-budget, star-driven films. And so they could hire interesting talent, give them a little more creative control, not spend a lot of money, and hopefully have some hits. And so they brought on Dave Bautista, who produced the film as well. Mm -hmm. So they were very much working with him. And they had a script by the Hober brothers, John and Eric. Do you remember the Hober brothers? Because we've talked about them a couple times. I don't. I I feel like I should, though. So they wrote the two Red films. Oh, okay. That's primarily what we would have known them for. But um, they got their start in the late 90s, working on kind of a Tarantino riff movie. Um, called Montana, but where they kind of made their names was they did a movie in 2009, a Kate Beckinsale film called Whiteout, which was an adaptation of a graphic novel. They did Red, which was a hit. Mm -hmm. Um, Whiteout, not so much. Um, Obviously, better to focus on colors, not shades. Sure. Uh, That worked out a little better for them. Sure. Um, They did, they worked on, they were one of, you know, an army of writers working on Battleship for Peter Berg. Mm -hmm. Uh, They worked on the two Meg films, Meg 1 and Meg 2. Uh, and also recently Transformers Rise of the Beasts, and they also returned for My Spy, The Eternal City. So they are very much kind of studio, franchise-friendly writers, Mm -hmm. but uh, this feels kind of in line with what you might expect from them. Well, given what I know about Red, um, I have seen Battleship, but I don't see much of their work in that. Uh... I mean, who knows with that one? That, that that film is a mess. I mean, I don't know much about its history, but just watching it, it's a mess. Yeah. Oh, it's it's terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Um. But no, okay. I didn't know the lineage goes from, from red to this, but you can see the DNA for sure. They're like thinking, old spies worked really well for us. What about young spies? Mm, what's next? Middle-aged spies? Oh, is that <gasps> a film about us? <laughs> or just James Bond. <laughs> oh, I, I was more excited about us. Oh, it's like it's like guys who are like dealing with like m- mild medical issues. Um, they're sorting out their pensions, hmm. getting close to that time. One of us buys a motorcycle, sobbing into their hands at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, what you do for lubricant is your business, can. But please continue. <laughs> so this was directed by Peter Siegel, who um, started out writing and directing a 1987 short called. Bikini 2, the saga continues. The saga continues. Oh, I wonder what happened to Bikini 3. Did the saga end? I don't know. What about Bikini 1? Was there ever Bikini 1? I somehow doubt it. Well, bikinis are a two-piece, so it has to end at two. You're right. You're right. Unless there's multiple people, and then you might have four or six. Oh, like multiple bikinis. Well, what if someone like uh, is wearing a one-piece? <gasps> 
you've thrown everything out of whack. This no longer works. <sighs> this this is cinema. This is cinema, Cam. You can't call it bikini. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you can't. It's, it's swimsuit. Yeah. Oh, a bikini, the swimsuit chronicles. <laughs> I'm guessing this was a uh, comedy short that he made. Sure. Um, because he was then brought on to oversee multiple Tom Arnold TV specials. He did like three or four of them. Right. So I thought that was like kind of fascinating. I'm like, wow, is Tom Arnold cranking a lot of TV specials in the like 90s? Because I certainly don't remember them. I, I, I have no bearing on Tom Arnold's career apart from True Lies. That's the thing. I mean, True Lies, when he was cast in that, it was actually quite controversial is a strong word but people were like really like outraged yeah they were outraged <laughs> new york times how dare they they had like they were picketing in the streets it was like that movie i don't even remember what it was where they had signs that just said unfair it's just like <laughs> benedict arnold <laughs> but yeah like tom arnold <laughs> when he was like cast in true lies people were like are you serious why would you cast tom arnold and mm. he proved himself like he was great in that movie but people were genuinely surprised and he was not particularly popular at that point in time. So I'm not sure like what the market was for Tom Arnold TV specials around that time period. I mean, to be fair, we've, we had Rick Friedberg on the show who directed Spy Hard many years ago. And he, he cut his teeth doing straight-to-DVD Leslie Nielsen golf comedy videos. So there's, a, there's obviously an audience for these things out there. You say straight-to-DVD. No, it was straight-to-VHS. Straight-to-VHS. I'm sorry. It's like it's mail order, this stuff. Yeah. Is. Yeah. 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 Um, straight to Bet- Betamax here in the UK, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Peter Siegel's big break came when he was handpicked to direct Naked Gun 33 and a third, The Final Insult, by Zuckers and Abraham. Keeping up the Leslie Nielsen there. There you go. Yeah. So uh-huh. they had, Zuckers and Abraham had overseen the first two Naked Guns, but didn't want to direct the third one. And so they produced the film, but brought on Peter Siegel to direct. Okay. And there's obviously, there's also a True Lies connection in this film. Apart from the Tom Arnold connection. There are a lot of Arnold connections in this film. A lot. Mm. Uh, So um, Peter Siegel goes on and he has a pretty notable comedy directing career. You may not love all these movies, but you'll know what they are. He directed Tommy Boy with Chris Farley and David Spade, which was obviously a hit. Um, He directed My Fellow Americans, which was a James Garner, Jack Lemmon comedy. Uh, He did Nutty Professor 2, The Clumps. Oh, boy. Then he teams up with Adam Sandler. And directs Anger Management, Fifty First Dates, and The Longest Yard. Some good stuff there. Okay. Fifty First Dates. Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he directs the Get Smart film with Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway. Okay. Sounds like someone we should get on at some point. Yeah. And then his career kind of gets a little rough. Um, he does, in 2013, a movie called Grudge Match, which was a De Niro Stallone boxing comedy that, like, I, to the best of my memory, it was released at Christmas, and nobody went. It was like a real lump of coal at the box office for a grudge match. So it went down in the first round, right? It really... I don't even know if it made it into the ring. Okay. It may have tripped uh, when the entrance music kicked in. <laughs> so it tripped on someone's soda on the way in, and just like, <laughs> yeah. everyone just sort of looked away awkwardly, like, oh, oh no. Like, flailing on the ground. <laughs> like, help me, <laughs> help me. on the floor like water, and just like, oh, I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> and someone just dragged it out by its leg. <laughs> With it, like a shepherd's crook, just like pulled it out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the fail horn from Price is Right uh, kicked in. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is uh, it was originally going to be our uh, entrance theme. Of course, of course, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then he did a lot of TV work after that. He also actually directed a Ken Jeong uh, TV special. So that may also explain why Ken Jeong is here. Like there would have been a relationship between him and Peter Siegel. Sure. I mean, the way you say that implicates that, like, Ken Jeong shouldn't be getting work. And the only way he gets work is through, like, connections. Um, I, I feel bad for Ken Jeong because I think he's quite funny. It's like, oh, the only way clearly he could get this job is if he knows the director. Fucking hell, Ken. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, like, you know, it's so much is about relationships. And I think if you've worked with a director previously, he probably contacts you and is like, hey, you want to be in my movie? Sure. Because this is not a big role. This is a. This is basically a cameo. Cam's backtracking right now. <laughs> so hard. Not at all. Not at all. I'm actually a real fan of Ken Jeong. So, um, <laughs> biggest fan who ever lived of Ken Jeong. <laughs> I Jong. love him. He's the best. Jeong, Jeong, Jeong. I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. <laughs> I'm a Kenny. I'm a Ken. I don't know. What, what, what's a Ken Jeong fan? Jongs? Ken file? I don't know. Ken, Ken, you want to go with the file straight away? Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave you to you in the fan base. You can get on with that. 
Uh, sure. Um, and so this was actually Peter Siegel's follow-up to the 2018 J-Lo comedy Second Act, which I feel like came and went. Because I had to look it up. Actually, Just like her so marriage. Oh, topical humor from Scott. This plays really uh, well in 2027 when someone catches up with this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she may have got married and divorced again. Who knows? Oh, maybe it's the joke that just keeps on giving, perhaps. I know, I know. Yeah. Future proof, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so, yeah, you had like some established talent on working on this one. Mm-hmm. Um. And there's not a lot on behind the scenes, but uh, Chloe Coleman, who was cast, obviously, as Sophie in the film, Mm-hmm. had a quote i saw from an interview she's the only one that did press for this movie like no one else talked about this movie other than her i think because of the release right probably it was a pandemic release so i think mm-hmm. that's why but uh she just had a quote she said i grew up loving spy movies so i was so excited to be in this movie about spies sold i mean it's not often you see like a child actor say how much they love spy movies that's that's kind of odd in itself she's like Timothy Hutton in The Falcon and the Snowman is my guy. I love that film. She's like, what? So I dug up, I actually found another interview where she named her two favorite spy films. Oh my God. I was joking, but what are her two favorite spy films? Wait, two... can you, can, can I like guess? Sure. Can, I, can you give me like a decade or something? No. Oh. Um, are, they, are they Bond films? No. Okay. I'm going to go with Three Days of the Condor. Okay. And mm, Three Days of the Condor and uh, an 80s film or something. Uh, oh, Spies Like Us. Okay. No, the answer is The Emperor's Candlesticks and The House on 92nd Street. <laughs> <laughs> you had me for a second. I was like, what? What? What world is this? <laughs> I really loved M. Butterfly. Shut up. <laughs> I just loved... The... Listeners, you didn't see the look on Scott's face when the Emperor's candlestick came out of my mouth. <laughs> His eyes just widened <laughs> of this nine-year-old sitting and watching William Powell comedies. <laughs> on YouTube, probably. <laughs> Spy Hard Specials. She, she's, a, she's a big fan of the show, I hear. <laughs> No, I don't know what her favorites were. I'm going to guess Bond and Mission Impossible. <laughs> oh, you didn't even get that quote. You made that no. all up. No, the quote was real. Her thing about growing up watching spy films, but I filled in the two favorite spy films. Oh, oh what a shame. What a shame. Because <laughs> I think, like, what would a kid been watching? Maybe Spy Kids as well? Yeah, it could have been Spy Kids. Um, I would have said Goldeneye around her age. No way. Or Casino Royale, maybe. No, Casino Royale. No way. She's born in, like, t- 2012 or something, isn't she? <laughs> Yeah, I know, but like, it's like when kids now like watch something, and they're like, "Oh, I found I watched this really old film the other day. It was called The Matrix." Right, sure. And you're like, oh, and you die a little bit inside. I think uh, maybe it's got to be Mission Impossible. Those are just so much more, I think, accessible to young kids. Yeah, probably. It's probably Fallout and um, yeah, maybe Spy Kids. Yeah, because I just think like the Craig era Bond films aren't as kid friendly. No, but Casino Royale had a very wide... Uh, Skyfall could be in that contention, too. I just remember my my friend Parv showed um, her, her son um, mm-hmm. Casino Royale, because she really mm-hmm. loved that movie. And she said, like... And he'd seen the Conneries, and he'd seen the the um, the Roger Moore Bond films. I'm not sure about the Daltons or Lazenby, but um, he just was so confused by the end of Casino Royale. Like, he didn't understand the plot of it at all, because it was quite adult they're talking about like betting on 9-11 and stocks and all that sort of thing it's not the villain with a plot to take over the world and you know put everything underwater or take you know everyone to space yeah it's not an austin powers film no and so i remember her son really just struggled with it a lot the johnny english films are quite approachable for kids as well oh that's a good example yeah johnny english Mm -hmm. um it's like it's like the the family friendly austin powers film yeah, not as big in North America, but that doesn't mean they didn't see them on TV. Yeah. No, but the first one certainly did all right, I think. And, you know, that's a nice little uh, breather after watching The Emperor's Candlesticks. Right. You're like, what did they do with those candlesticks? Oh, who knows? But uh, let, let's talk about John Malkovich being the King of England. Sure, sure. Maybe Red. Yeah. Maybe she was a big fan of the oh. Red films. And that, and then she was like, Peter Siegel? Oh, I can't wait to be directed by him. He did Red 1 and 2. That's both her films. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> oh, he didn't. Damn. Who was the... Oh, the writers. I'm sorry. It was the writers. 
Oh, no, that that joke fell flat, like most of mine do. That's right. Uh, so <laughs> this movie was delayed. Actually, it was supposed to come out in August 2019, mm-hmm. um, but they uh, ended up pushing it to July 2020. That was the plan, and they pushed it because there was two reasons. The Dave Bautista, Kamel Nanjiani film Stuber came out in the summer of 2019, and they wanted to distance it a little bit. Sure. Just so you didn't have kind of back-to-back press tours with Dave Bautista and audiences mm-hmm. getting confused. Yeah. Uh, and also, STX wanted to put all of their kind of push behind Hustlers, which was something they saw a lot of potential in, which is the J-Lo. And that did quite well, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And they were hoping it would get some Oscar attention. It didn't. But I think it deserved a little bit, actually. I thought Hustlers was very, very good. And so they, I think at that point, were putting their somewhat limited marketing muscle behind Hustlers as opposed to distracting themselves and kind of aiming in separate directions trying to promote My Spy. I think they have different um, audiences for sure. Well, I mean, this movie cost $18 million. Mm. So I don't think the marketing budget is very high. I don't think they're spending a lot on marketing. And my guess is they have limited income for this. So they're probably like, let's put all the money behind Hustlers right now and focus on My Spy later. Well, I mean, clearly, like, I saw tons of trailers and posters for Hustler when that film came out. I never saw the film, but, like, I I felt its presence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was one that was definitely being pushed as a major film, Mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of a, you know, modest release in a busy weekend. I mean, this is the the definition of the the mid-budget film that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. I mean, this is actually low budget. 18 million? That's like nothing. Sure, this is low budget, but like, you know, Matt Damon did that famous interview where he said like, these films don't exist anymore. This is an example of those films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is, this is mole rats. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That, that, it's not a, it's not a indie film. It's not that sort of thing. It, it's also not a major motion picture in the sense of like $20 million. But, you know, 20, sorry, I mean $200 million, but $20 million in this case, I think, is, is enough money to make a, a competent film and have a wide release, which it was supposed to have had. Exactly, because as you said right there, supposed to have had the pandemic started, and so they just realized that releasing My Spy was not going to happen in July of 2020, so they sold the distribution rights to Amazon, which is why it was in North America, only shown on Amazon, mm. um, on Prime, it did have an international release in some territories. So as I said, the budget was $18 million. Domestically, it made nothing because it wasn't released. Yeah. International, $10.2 million for a worldwide total of $10.2 million. I mean, whatever the rights they got for the uh, North American distribution plus that money, I'm sure they probably covered their bets. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I'll get to a little kind of footnote on that in a second. But uh, it was number 113 for the year between Street Dancer 3D and 100% Wolf. Is that the prequel to Wolf's on uh, <laughs> Apple TV Plus now? I don't know what it is. Um, it's 100% yeah. though, whatever it is. It is 100%. You don't want to watch like 62% Wolf. You don't, you don't want a fake Wolf. You don't want a half Wolf. You get full Wolf here. That's a pretty good title, actually. It depends what it is. It's either a good title or a terrible title. But either way... Well, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a family comedy... Yeah, it's a bit of a terrible title. If it's a film about wolves, then maybe it's okay. Let's see. I'm going to look it up right now. Oh, Cam wants me to vamp whilst he Googles something. 100% wolves. It's, it's, it's not even showing up. <laughs> oh, here it is. Here it is. I got it. Um, oh, oh, okay. It's actually an animated kids film. Okay. That got no attention, obviously. Uh, and it is, it looks like. Getting some now. We are giving it attention. Looks like it's actually a 100%. A North American film, I think. Okay. Uh, but it has voices by Samara Weaving, Jai Courtney, and Jane Lynch. What's the synopsis, please? It is. 100% Wolf centers on Freddy Lupin, heir to a proud family line of werewolves. Positive he'll become the most fearsome werewolf ever, Freddy is in for a shock when his first warfing goes awry, turning him into a ferocious poodle. Sounds like a howl. Hmm. Yeah, well, it barked its way to uh, some... Do you call it wolfings when they transform? I've never heard that term before in my life. No. Let us know, folks. Is is a transforming werewolf called a wolfing? Wolfing. Wolfing. Yeah. Yeah. W-A-L-F. Okay. We're we're, we're going way off the rails here, but yeah, that's a weird one. But yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, in in low-down company at 100 nod, whatever it was. 
Yeah, I wonder if it was Australian, because it's got a couple Australian actors doing voices there, so... Either way, either way, 100% Wolf uh, made a little bit less than My Spy. Not a great time for family films when no, no. one's going to a theater. Just ask Mulan. Right, exactly. Also straight to streaming, yeah. Or not a family film, but like Black Widow was also, you know, in streaming. Yeah. And quickly forgotten about. Mm, yes. Uh, so the top three for the year, of course, this is the pandemic year, so it's going to be some movies you're not necessarily familiar with. Number one, Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yeba, the movie, Mugen Train. Of course. What else? Which was a uh, Japanese anime film made mm -hmm. a crap ton of money, like over $400 million. So uh, it did pretty well. Number two was The 800, which was a Chinese historical epic. And number three was Bad Boys for Life. I still never seen that or the sequel. They're pretty good. Pretty good, actually. Yeah, you wouldn't think so, but they are actually pretty good. Fair enough. Something to watch on the rainy day. That's right. And the final note. Uh, so a sequel was announced to My Spy extremely shortly after streaming release. Okay. Uh, due to the impressive viewership numbers. Sure. Like less than a month after My Spy hit Amazon Prime, they were like, we got to get a sequel going. Okay. The fact it took four years is kind of surprising, but uh, they really were invested in the my spy universe um so i mean it's actually kind of shocking they didn't crank one out in like one year or two well considering it's quite low budget and small in cast i think that you could have done it quicker but maybe there was just like maybe dave was just busy well i mean i guess also just pandemic restrictions in 2020 when they're putting this out they're not like we can rush into production tomorrow it no. probably took a little bit to get it going and i imagine like a lot of films got held over for actors like dave batista and ken I don't, I don't know who else is in the sequel, but I imagine it was a scheduling thing. They probably shot it in 2023 and obviously came out this year. Yeah, Kristen Schaal is also in the uh, sequel. So. Okay, sure. Is that is that the uh, the dossier on My Spy? That is the dossier on the film that is My Spy. Okay, well, it's an interesting one because this is a bit of a, a mishmash of genre in the sense of it's a family film. It's also a comedy. Um, it's kind of Spy Kids-esque, I suppose. It's kindergarten cop. Well, it's like beat for beat kindergarten cop. It's it it's kindergarten cop, kindergarten spy is what I wrote down. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I only watched that for the first time this year. Oh, okay. I mean, I saw it a couple times as a kid, and then I watched it when I did the Arnie Geddon podcast. So mm -hmm. I'm fairly up on my um uh kindergarten cop. Okay, and, and and yeah, it is mostly beat for beat. Even like the love interest with the mom, everything like that. The partner even looks the same uh similar type yeah it's interesting like um a lot of these wrestlers go through these films these like kid comedies family friendly films like you got two fairy for the rock uh -huh. i'm sure john cena's done a couple as well yeah he did the one about was it like fireman recently sure i'll take your word for it with like young kids i don't even remember i think it was called playing with fire maybe sure that sounds yeah, like exactly. a, a straight to dvd video for me um yeah, it's interesting, but like of all those ones I've listed, this is probably the best of the bunch. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it started with Kindergarten Cop. It was such a huge hit for Arnold, mm -hmm. and so then it became this like almost like lazy um, thing that action stars would just do. They're like, well, now I have to do the kid comedy, yeah. and Kindergarten Cop is like pretty well made. It was directed by um, Ivan Reitman. Yeah, like, there's some muscle behind that one, and it and there's some pretty good shootouts and stuff at the end. Like it's got it's got some like credibility. Yeah, it's got some solid action. Arnold's very good in the movie. He's like yeah. legit very good. His comic timing is like kind of at its heights in that film. And also the kids are great. Like it relies upon that too. The kids are solid, and then you know that movie's a huge hit. And so I think a lot of agents look on paper and go, "Well, action star with kids. That's the formula." It's mm -hmm. not about the filmmaker. It's not about the film itself. It's just about that formula. And so that's how you get like the pacifier with Vin Diesel, mm. which was horrendous. The Tooth Fairy with The Rock, which I never saw, but I heard was pretty lousy. Triple H did one as well. Like he did a, a like, I'm going to look it up, but like Triple H did one with kids. They tried to do that and didn't work. Yeah. Hulk Hogan had Mr. Nanny, uh, which I appreciated as a kid. I don't know if I would appreciate now um the chaperone it was called the chaperone oh god okay um yeah. jackie chan had the spy next door which we'll tackle at some point in the future yeah uh it just became the go-to thing but none of these movies 
really had any sort of like uh, muscle behind the sc- behind the camera on them. No, I, but I would say like if we're gonna pivot that into my spy, yeah, I think this. Well, I'll I'll just jump in. I found this to be an utterly charming film. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay, yes, it is playing with kindergarten cop like basically beat for beat and it's like riffs to other films in their spy game true lies we've got nods in this film but i mean it's it's 90 minutes basically from the credit to the beginning to the credits yeah and i don't think i had a boring moment i don't think i ever really looked at my watch i found dave batista and chloe coleman to be great together they had some great chemistry and i think a lot of these kids films that have kids in them rely on the child actors and i think she was a great find Mm mm-hmm um, she really helps this film move along, and you know the 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 secondary cast are no one you know not to sniff at either. But I think the joy in this film for me comes down to the chemistry between Batista and Coleman, and I, I whenever they're just like going back and forth, I think it's great. I mean the the film maybe sags a little bit when the plot has to come back in in the last ten minutes, yeah, because they have to do that. But you know the the other seventy odd minutes where they're just you know one upping each other and being sassy with one another and stuff, I think it's just great. I appreciated the chemistry of the two leads in this movie. I okay. think that is a very tough thing to do. Is to you know we've seen it. We have uh-huh. seen. We've just named several examples of bringing precocious kids in and putting them next to an action star. Spy Kids Five. Sure. Yeah, but I I remember the pacifier like that was awful. That movie. Mm. Um. And so, you know, that could be just like a recipe for absolute disaster. And I thought that like Chloe Coleman walked a very fine line because this kid could be maddening in a different film. Could absolutely obnoxious in a different film. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought she was actually quite good and paired very well with Dave Bautista. Like, I mm-hmm. think he is really strong here. And that's kind of what the entertainment is for me with this movie, because this yeah. is a movie that is going through the motions in every sense of the word everything from the script to the direction to everything is just like it's it feels like it's just perfunctory it's yeah. like yeah, yeah yeah just follow the beats follow the beats who cares who cares it feels so uninvested in its set pieces or anything like that mm-hmm. it's just relying entirely on us liking the two stars and because of the fact we do that i walked out of the movie going oh that was that was charming enough but yeah i mean it had let's just say if i'm to make a list of negatives and positives the negative list is very very long it just so happens that dave bautista and chloe coleman are propping this thing up with her- herculean effort i see I, I i mean i can definitely see where you're coming from i don't think i will i don't think i'll find any point you make in terms of detractors that i will butt up against but i i just it's one of those things where I, I think if you can get me on board with the characters, mm-hmm. I'll forgive a lot of sins. Sure. And so, like, I was just kind of with it. Like, I just wanted to hang out with them. And so I didn't really fuss about it being a, you know, a, a copy of Kindergarten Cop. Like, it, it just, it is, and that's fine. And it is going through the motions. And it, this film is full of cliche. Oh, yeah. It's full of tropes. Like, it, I mean, I'm pretty sure, like, a year one screenwriter could, you know, pump this out. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And I mean, the thing is, like, had Batista and this kid not meshed well at all, this would have been a horrible ser- experience. This would have been one of the worst movies we've tackled on Spy Hearts. <laughs> I yeah. think I would have been like, yeah. oh my god, I got nothing. But I mean, Dave Batista is pretty much on camera the entire film, mm-hmm. and he's a legit strong actor. It's not like in the past where you had someone like Hulk Hogan, you know, occupying center frame for the entire film. Hulk Hogan's not a strong actor. No. And Dave, Dave Bautista is. And so when you're asking me to buy into the like uh, the trauma this man's gone through, losing his team in the field a lot, it works. Yeah, I believe him as someone who's like slowly opening up and connecting with this kid. And even it made the absolutely absurd romantic subplot somewhat work. This is a thing that, I mean, how often in life is it like children setting up their parents in movies? Like it's... The most like old hacky trope and something that in real life would never work. But I'm like, when when that started like happening, I was like, oh God, please God, no, not again. Well, I mean, you could see like every single twist in this film, it, it you see from a mile away. Oh. From a mile away. I I didn't mind. Yeah, they're all heavily telegraphed. But when you have that kid taking that role, I'm like, this is like the hackiest thing I've seen in some time mm-hmm. to go back to this trope that was like worn out in the 1980s. Yeah. Um, 
but like uh i felt like dave bautista and even like parisa fitz henley who plays the romantic interest mm -hmm. they were pretty good together so i wasn't even like crawling out of my skin watching it i was like oh you know what these two actors are kind of charming so it, it did massive amounts of effort in terms of uh kind of paving over things that should have been really grating to watch well it, it just also goes to show like this is how important casting directors are yeah no kidding because yeah I, I, if you just put a bunch of names into a hat for each of these characters and just drew them out randomly this film is a complete roll of the dice can you imagine if this has like stone cold steve austin in the lead oh yeah i, I just wrote about halfway through i wrote down such a cliche batista lifts it up but this could be any actor in the role yeah and i think like dave batista being a producer on this film also knows how to kind of uh tailor it to his strengths mm -hmm. and so like he seems like someone who has a very strong sense as to what makes him work on screen mm. and what his strengths are and how to play to them because like had he had no control in this movie i i question whether they would have delivered something that made him look as good well you'll note there's never a moment where like he's in a tutu right yeah and you know what you know I'll, actually this is a point for the movie too which is they set up that whole thing of talking about him having a tea party with her mm -hmm. and later in the film when you know there's the false crisis she gives him like the picture of them having a tea party yeah and that's the payoff we don't get a scene of dave bautista having to sit there and talk to stuffed animals and drink imaginary tea no it's the samuel L. jackson not wanting to run mm. like don't display the weaknesses okay he might look silly and you want your character to look your lead character who is your main spy look strong and okay he's being he's because the problem is like in concept and in you know his his entire uh, his agency is is sort of removed because he is such an inept spy that he is outclassed by a twelve year old girl. Yeah. So immediately as a viewer, you're like, well, this guy's no good. But because mm. everyone's so charming, you're you're willing to forgive the, all these sins. And that's I think playing to the strengths of Dave Bautista and and, and obviously the rest of the cast. And, I, and I'm glad they did that because I think yeah this could be really upsetting in, in in another direction but let's let's look at the things that we did like because i i think my list is probably longer than yours go for it um i mean i we've spoken about their chemistry but i'll just jump on it for a second kid actors are it's potluck yeah you know like you i mean for every like chloe coleman there is an anakin skywalker sure right wizard uh, nothing against uh, yeah uh, let's try spinning that's a good trick uh yeah I could, I could quote that movie ad infinitum but it doesn't mean it's a good film to be fair though it comes down to direction and dialogue too because i don't I, that poor mm. kid jake lloyd was not getting strong direction or dialogue no and there's plenty of other like even the kids in spy kids 5 we recently spoke about not great and that and, and robert rodriguez is a good director and has directed kids to good performances yeah so like there's something missing there, right? Yeah. Um, and and so like I'm glad they found Chloe, and I, I I'm glad she's back for the sequel. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with the character moving forward, because again, she's got that sort of smart Alec, like she can fix anything, and that could be like a real like busybody annoyance in some films. Whereas this, mm -hmm. it's just you're actually just charmed by her. I'm going back to the word charming. You actually want to see her like uh, undermine Batista because it actually provide some comedy and there's a lot of moments where like she would just like throw in these like cuts at him and his like m fragile male ego and like you just hear him go jesus christ <laughs> and and it's like i mean obviously that's not written for her there's not chloe coming up with those things but it, it actually like it's quite witty at times yeah i i like that she very much had the upper hand on him yeah. and they say that one of the str like the keys to getting a good child performance is a strong director who knows how to work with kids or also you know or and also a um leading actor who's with them that knows mm -hmm. how to work with them and i know that they said like bruce willis was invaluable in the sixth sense mm -hmm. and m night Shyamalan is actually very good with kids as well um and so Haley joe osmond really gets to shine there he's a great actor but he also is being given so much support to really perform at a high level mm -hmm. and i think here um, I don't really know if like Peter Siegel has a long history of directing kids, given the credits I named there, but I think Dave Bautista knows how to work with kids really well. And perhaps part of the reason, you know, when you get to the third Guardians film, they've got Drax with like an army of kids. 
mm. and Dave Bautista, you know, getting them all like laughing and joking around with them. So he clearly has that ability. So I think it was just a, a very good, you know, merging of talents there and his ability to play off of her was great. And mm -hmm. putting her in that position of having the upper hand and realizing that that would be funny. Yeah. And, and I think that will sort of bring me to my other like is I genuinely laughed at this film. Okay. Which is actually more than I can say for some of the comedies we've tackled. I think I laughed once. Okay. Uh, it was the scene where the pigeon got uh, taken out <laughs> by the hawk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and like make everyone listen to a podcast where I point out the funny moments in the film. That that's, sounds like torture. But like, I, I just think <laughs> I was either in the right mood for this film or it was working for me, but it, it like the I think whenever they Chloe and Batista were on screen together, they, it just it was fun moments. And I I go back to the actual like the barbs between them. A lot of the time was where I found a lot of the comedy. Right. Yeah. Um. And and it's also interesting that like the comedians in the film, uh, famously uh, Kristen Scowl and Ken Young, are, are mostly playing it straight. Yeah. Like. Um. Yeah. Uh, Kristen Schaal plays a little bit. Um kind of wacky like she's definitely very similar to the Kooky. partner in yeah in kindergarten cop very very similar yeah um and they give her the jamie lee curtis scene where she drops the uzi down the stairs the uzi down the stairs which i, I thought was a nice touch I, I was like really we're bringing that back the moment that everyone hates in true lies <laughs> okay fair enough <laughs> but, yeah i mean they, they play it like a little bit better in the sense of like is that is it better i don't know it might fit this material better because it's a kids movie whereas in true lies it felt it felt too cartoony in that movie and true lies is pretty straight yeah yeah and also you're trying to give like um jamie lee curtis all his agency and then she picks up a gun and goes oh and then drops it down the stairs whereas kristen scowl has no like field experience and she points it out ex like several times and then drops her gun yeah yeah like I feel like in True Lies, that's the moment where you want Jamie Lee Curtis to show some strength and then mm. like undercut her. Yeah. Uh, versus here, yeah, it's someone who's incredibly cocky but has no experience whatsoever. And so that's kind of the joke. Yeah, which is more us. But um, So I gave two, but what's a like you have? Um, I thought that, um, that you had a couple supporting characters that actually worked. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that um, Devere Rogers and Noah Dalton, uh, Danby, playing the gay couple living in the apartment complex mm -hmm. who kind of pop in and out of their you know story were actually really fun and i liked that uh one half of the partnership todd is a therapist and he's a very good therapist mm. and never speaks the entire film just grunts he's very monosyllabic yes every scene it is the carlos half of the equation interrogating people or asking questions while todd just sits there silently and stares i thought that was actually a really funny dynamic and i gotta be honest if we're going to talk about how much this movie is telegraphed in every other aspect i didn't see the twist with them coming you didn't see it coming wow i didn't i don't know why i didn't okay listeners who haven't watched the film but want it to be spoiled here is the spoiler if not skip ahead 20 seconds but the the gay couple are freelance spies who are hired to also get the uh, the MacGuffin that they're chasing. Yeah, that really didn't occur to me because this felt like a non-assignment. Like, that was kind of the point of the movie, is that... It was low grade. It was, it like... was very low grade. Like, the villain is after plans for, like, a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And so they're sending all the, you know, the, the primary agents out into, you know, places like Berlin and Paris to track the actual villain. Mm. Um, whereas Dave Bautista, basically, it's babysitting duty for like the niece yeah of um the villain just because they might be factoring in somehow so it didn't occur to me there would be other spies there because i thought well this is babysitting duty that we know is going to turn into the main event mm -hmm. but the other characters don't know this so i really didn't expect other agents to be involved at that level i mean you could argue that twist is just in there for the sake of a twist it is <laughs> um and, and that's definitely an argument that i would be willing to hear but I, they just seemed like they were given too much time to not have a, a some sort of import on the plot. And so I knew something was good. The ball was going to drop at some point with them. I didn't necessarily know how or whose side they'd be on. Like for a lot of the time, for me, they were like actually sent there to like watch over them by someone else. Mm, right. Instead of like being a long con. 
Uh, but either way, it works. But yeah, they were uh, they were a delight to watch. Um, the 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 silent partner, if you pardon the pun, uh, Noah Dalton Danby as Todd, reminded me a lot of um, that actor who played Hercules in the Thor film. I'm forgetting the name of Brett Goldstein. Yeah. Um, who has a similar style of character in everything he does, um, including Ted Lasso. Oh, okay. He reminded this actor reminded me of a young David Fincher. He he just looks like David Fincher a little bit. Oh, okay, right. There's a physical thing here, right? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I kept looking at him. I'm like, why does this guy look so familiar? Did he direct Alien Three? What's going on? I'm going through his credits, and I'm like, I don't really know him from very much at all. Why do I recognize him? And then I was like, oh no, I think it's because he looks a little bit like David Fincher. I wonder how many times he's heard that. Um, I think he would take that as a compliment, so hopefully many. Have you ever been told you look like a director? Director, no. Uh, just uh, Rami Malek, I think, is, uh, and Fred Savage. That's what I've heard. Rami Malek, you've said to me before, and it's actually uncanny when I sort of like put my, eye, I put my eyes together a little bit and squint. It's like, oh, Christ, yeah, he does. Yeah, I was mistaken for him in Las Vegas. And then uh, when I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not, he said, well, are you his twin brother then? Because he does have a twin brother. Mm. And I was like, no, sorry, sorry. I should have signed something. That would have been funnier, but uh, yeah. You should have just but like spelled it incorrectly, like Malik E-K or something. What I should have done is said I am Rami Malik and then behaved incredibly like bizarre. Like, Give me money. Wildly bizarre. Give me money. Like, just... <laughs> Start like dancing. <laughs> it's $20. Keep going. I'm like, go Rami, go Rami. I'm like, well, dancing in place. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this guy definitely is Rami Malek. Jeez. He, he's like clearly out of his mind. Yeah, he's off his nut. What's going on? <laughs> um, in terms of other likes, uh, I mean, there's probably a few other things I could dive into. But um, one thing I, I will give this film credit for, although your, I don't want to say like dislike of it, but maybe lack of enjoyment of this film maybe disproves my point. But one thing we lambasted the later Spy Kids films for was having a lack of appeal to other ages. Mm, yeah. I think this is played right down the middle, and I don't think parents would be pulling their hair out if they watched this with a kid. I thought the same, actually. That, I guess, is a bit of a like in that, yeah, when you watch a lot of kids' movies, they're very juvenile. Like, if you mm-hmm. watch The Pacifier as an adult, you're a masochist. Like, why would you do that? Coming in hot on the pacifier cam. What is this? Uh, that one just lingers in my mind as, of like the worst of those kind of adult action hero and kid movies. Uh, Fair. Although I haven't seen a few of them. So maybe if I when we watch, you know, the spy next door, I'll feel the same. Who knows? But mm. um, yeah, so I always think of that one. But those movies are just aimed at like, I don't know, six year olds. It feels like only. It's like Minions films. Like, it's just like it's just making noises at people. Although people seem to like Minions at some level, so I don't know. I've never watched a Minions movie, so maybe I shouldn't take a swipe at them. Me either. Maybe, we, yeah, maybe I shouldn't either. I've, uh, yeah, I've seen one of the Despicable Me's. I think um, that's about as close as I've gotten. Okay, yeah, I've seen the first two, but they're like vanished from my mind completely. Uh, it's weird you didn't say you look like Gru. I look like a minion. <laughs> well, <laughs> banana, banana. <laughs> I just thought my screen was really yellow. I don't know. That's strange. <laughs> Yeah, um, but this movie had a few lines that I was kind of surprised by, mm. uh, or I'd go, like, huh? Like he, like at one point, Chloe Coleman's character Sophie, uh, you know, saying farewell to them and says like farewell to your lesbian partner, Bobby, and I was like, did I just hear that? Yeah, and I rewound it and went, I did hear that. Uh, that I didn't expect to hear uh, in a kids movie. There was also some violence that I went, ha, huh. like. There's a part where um, the villain like stabs someone and it's bloodless, mm. but it's still pretty intense. And I thought, really? I mean, I guess if you go back to Kindergarten Cop, that movie's actually very violent. <laughs> Especially the end bit, like in, when, the, when the, the guy is storming the school. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like he's a pretty scary, violent villain. So I guess they are. I mean, they are following the, uh, the notes of uh, Kindergarten Cop pretty much to a T. So they kept that element as well and that they made the violence often a little more intense than you'd expect. Whereas, like, I remember the pacifier was going very Home Alone and bad Home Alone, like those straight-to-video Home Alone sequels. Holiday Heist, am I right? I, I I can't say I've seen any of them other than, like, Home Alone 1, 2, and 3. 
I'm in the same boat, but I've seen little clips of the okay. straight to video ones. Okay, he, he he's he's coming in hot on the Home Alone sequels and the Pacifier, folks. Watch out, family friendly <laughs> films. Cam is not friendly with you. <laughs> yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Red alert, spy hards. We are shaking things up over on the Patreon page. That's right, we are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cam, tell the people what we have coming up next. Folks, bid October and the spooky season adieu by catching up with our latest Patreon offerings. That's right, reviews of The Exorcist and Shaun of the Dead, plus the 2017 Taken TV pilot. A Taken TV show without Liam Neeson? Now that is scary. So strap on your Condor Man wings and soar into the future with us over at patreon.com slash spyhearts. But before Big O zaps us with a red pulsating laser, let's get back to the spy jinx. All right, dislikes. Sounds like you've got a bag full of them, Cam. Why don't you drop one on us? I don't really have a bag of them. It's just a, an overall template thing where it just feels like, mm. and I'll seg into it now. This movie so often just feels like it's going through the motions. Yeah. Like, it's very non-committal. And that it would set up a comedy set piece, and you're like, okay. And then it would just kind of, like, burn through it in, like, five seconds and be like, you know what? Uh, we can't be bothered. We can't be bothered. We got nothing. Like, I think of, I'll name two. Dave Bautista going skating. Mm -hmm. They're like, what's going to happen when Dave Bautista goes skating? We see him like fall down twice or we see a stuntman fall down twice. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that's that. Moving on. And I'm like, really? You built it all up for that? Okay. Like they clearly had no ideas whatsoever. They were just like, okay, uh, the script says he's going to go skating. Should we come up with some funny gags? Try to come up with an original idea? Nope. Just burn it through real quick. Mm -hmm. Sure. Go on. The other one is the date night with the with the the mom, Kate, uh, who again, pretty decent actor, uh, performing that role. But we get to the club and you have this is a trope that drives me crazy when it's people like doing surveillance on a date, uh, where you have other characters like cheering them on and watching them on a date. Mm. It's the worst. I just and I this is something that like. I, I, I'm not judging this movie too harshly because it wasn't that unbearable in this movie. But I remember like seeing, was it Failure to Launch or something? It was a Matthew McConaughey movie where you had like all of their friends sit there and watch surveillance tape of their like dates. And I'm like, do these people have no lives? And it was so unfunny and painful to watch that it just, it just, ugh, I, I get chills when that trope pops up. But here, nonetheless, you set that up where you have the surveillance of them. And they're like, Dave Bautista's gonna dance. And you get nothing out of it. I'm like, okay. He like busts a funny, a couple sort of half hearted, funny moves. And we cut out of there. And I'm like, why did you bother doing any of this if you didn't have some sort of comedy set piece you were gonna commit to? I'll ask you uh, a follow up question. Although I, I do agree. I think that, especially that dance scene, is a, is a bit cringy. Obviously, it gets a callback at the end. I couldn't believe when they said it got a million hits on YouTube. I'm like, get the F out of here. I mean, on, if you put it on TikTok, I could see that happening just because people will watch anything. A million? I mean, I, mean, I don't know anything about TikTok, maybe. But I'm like, on mm. YouTube, I'm like, get out of here. A million people are not watching just like this like kind of large, unassuming man dance. I mean, that, I, I, you could be entirely right. To be fair, like I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think TikTok it may have gone viral, but anything can go technically viral, just sure accidentally sometimes. So, but like I, in that scene, what were you looking for? Like a more of an elaborate joke? Well, like you're building this up. You have mm -hmm. characters all sitting there watching it. So what's funny about it? Well, he's making a fool of himself. But they don't stage in an interesting way. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone could do this. You like you could take any actor and be like, oh, just bust a couple funny moves okay well, so it goes back to my note earlier where anyone could be inhibiting this role it's it's so non-committal they have nothing they're just like uh i don't know what if dave bautista dances funny for a second like there's just no imagination going on with the screenwriting mm. the staging the direction anything like no one is trying to make anything interesting they're just like hit the beat move on yeah i i mean i i can't 
I can't quibble with your point. I think that probably is the 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 effort they put into it because, but I I I just didn't have a problem with it. I, I somehow this I think the charm of this film just sort of swept me away. But I I know what you mean, and I and I remember like when he was saying how he couldn't dance, and I just knew there was going to be an awkward dance scene coming. Yeah, like you don't say that without having to do that bit. Yeah, and so like I was just sort of like waiting for it to happen, and so I cr- cringed a little bit and moved on. But I, I know what you mean. Like maybe maybe your expectations were probably a bit high for this film. Oh, I expect a comedy to try to be funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I hope for, generally. Yeah. You know, if you're going to yeah. ask an audience to pay money, I mean, in theory, they want people to pay money. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be like, oh, let's give some comedy sequences. Let's try. That'd be nice. I um I've been I've been slapped in the mouth by a can there and I will sit back down. That's uh fine. I'll give you another one. I'll give you a third one. Okay. And it's not a comedy thing. The villain. What the hell was this? That's my next note. Okay, let's roll into yours then. <laughs> yeah. I mean my main dislike is there is no villain in this film. It's complete milk toast stuff here. Like this is I don't know his name, I barely know his plan, and I don't know the actor. I, I just sort of like he is in the background for ninety percent of this film. Turns up in the last twenty minutes and then gets killed. I made a note. Um, he showed up at the forty-three minute mark. Um, uh-huh. You know where he actually did something. Uh huh. And then he doesn't show up till about the end. Uh-huh. This character is. This is the most forgettable character in the history of Spy Hearts. There is no question to me in terms of villains. No one could ever compete with this guy. I'm just trying to think if there's anyone else that I would pick. But no, I think you may be right. I mean, there's been ones where we were like, oh, the villain's kind of generic or the villain doesn't really pop. But like, this isn't even a character. This is, is barely an actor. I mean, Greg Brick, uh, Greg Brick I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you may have done some things that are half decent, but like, there is just absolutely nothing here. I was honestly shocked that this passed in like a major motion picture. This seems like the kind of thing that would happen in like a straight to video movie because yeah. you just can't be bothered. Well, I, I just think that it had nothing. I mean, you, you talk about having nothing for a set piece, which I understand your point. I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with some of the set pieces you listed, but I think they had nothing for the villain. No. And you think, and if you're, and if you're sitting here comparing notes with Kindergarten Cop, which I don't think we necessarily should have, but a film that relies upon that film so much, you can't help yourself but look at it. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember the actor who played the villain, but I remember the villain. Sure, he had like the ponytail, and he was really intense. Yeah, yeah, and, and his mother was like a bit much too. And... Yeah, yeah. There was kind of a Hitchcockian thing going on. Yeah, and there was like a shootout in the shower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I remember all this. I mean, I've only watched the film this year, so both are quite fresh in my mind. But yeah, I, I they they had nothing when it came to the villain. And then you build to this like reveal of the gay couple being like, "We're independent agents. We're after this." And then I'm like, "Oh, oh, this was smart." They pulled the rug out from us, under us. They like presented this incredibly generic with capital letters villain for like, you know, a handful of minutes. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, oh no, these are the real villains in plain sight. And they had charisma and chemistry and that's really smart. But that's not the case. They pivot back to the really generic guy. And he gets the whole finale where they are verbally mentioning Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is a real bad idea. Don't verbally mention one of the all-time greatest action set pieces when you're showing this. Yeah, that uh, uh, that's another one on my notes, which I'll get to in a second. But like, uh, in terms of the, the, the gay couple uh, trickery, yeah, um, I actually th- I thought the same. And I was, I was thinking they were going down the path of Cloak and Dagger, where you have this like conglomeration, you have this set of uh, like these plans yeah. that they're trying to get back. And then there's this old couple that look after the kid, Henry Thomas, and then turn out to be the villains. And then they become the villains for the rest of the story. They're the ones working for the company. And they're the ones that you sort of focus upon. And so like, I thought that was a really good twist because that caught me off guard when mm. I first saw that film years ago and we talked about it. But it's the same thing here. They could have. And I think they would have had more to work with if they'd gone with the gay couple as the, as, as the, as the final boss of the film, as it were. Yeah. Like, I really thought that that would have been a strong direction to go mm-hmm. just to and you know you don't have to have them <laughs> being like hurled off a cliff into a fiery wreckage at the end like you could have them or blown up on the plane sure or you could have them even arrested or and brought back in a sequel because they're so much fun mm-hmm. so that would make sense as well and i think they do pop up in the sequel actually okay um, but yeah like you could have if you love those characters set it up for them to come back but it's just like so weird to put that much attention into a villain who uh, there's nothing like it. It's so un. It's not even. You can't say it's underwritten. It's not written. 
No, there's nothing. There is nothing there at all. And I think like those listening will just hear a sort of smacking down the character. I, I kind of want to give people listening a tangible, like how will you fix it or what you do with it. And I think that the main thing you do to fix this villain is give him more screen time. I'm not saying it's the actor's you know problem or fault with the performance or it's, it's more with the material given. He's given no screen time. He's not given any time to build up any menace. Mm-hmm. There is no threat. So when he turns up, you're like, okay, but Batista's here and he's proven to be good enough. He'll take care of it. And he does. And also, when I look at Dave Bautista and I look at this guy, not too scared. <laughs> I mean, in a fist fight, sure. But like, if you get guns, it doesn't matter how big you are. That's true. And you would say the same in Kindergarten Cop because Arnold was uh, a pretty large man himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was like a genuine menace to that villain. And he was in the school without mm-hmm. Arnold being there. Mm-hmm. Um, because Arnold had been off the case at this point, much like Dave Batista was. Yeah. But like, there was like a sense of like, the kid was in peril, and also the kid in, in Kindergarten Cop didn't have any agency. No. The kid was 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 basically subject to whatever the villain wanted to do. Whereas in this film, you know, Chloe Coleman's character, much you know, she doesn't really actually do much in terms of spy work. Actually, when you look back at it, but you know, there are some moments of Dave Batista t- teaching her tradecraft and stuff. Um, and that could have been used, but they didn't do any of that. But you, you don't get the sense of that she's ever in any danger. No, she gets the uh, one up on him at the end with her like lie detector breaking skills. Mm-hmm. Um, but also when you go to kindergarten cop, the the mom role in that. Yeah, this is a woman who was like in an abusive marriage, so there's a, an extra tension that comes from that, like her mm-hmm. fear of this ex husband coming back, that really works dramatically in the movie. Yeah. Um, whereas like here. I think one of the fixes is you establish a relationship between this character, who's the uncle, and them. There's nothing. Like, they feel almost like strangers. Here's, okay, I came up with an idea. Let's see if it works. Let's, let's workshop it. Two non screenwriters workshopping a screenplay, right? Perfect. Here's how you do it. So, if throughout the film, you have clips of, of this. So, the, for those who haven't seen the film, the relationship is as such the mother of the child. Oh, well, the father of the child is the brother of the villain. Yes. Okay, so it's it's her, it's the kid's uncle, basically, is the villain. Okay. And he is running rampant throughout Europe, trying to get hold of another half of plutonium, I think, to put a bomb together. It's a little vague. Or, some, or, or, or to sell parts or something like that. But basically, nefarious means. He needs the plans. The to plans. Something. There is a box that has something in it. It has, it has a flash drive in it that has the plans. Like that's. I think that's the yeah. gimmick. That's the MacGuffin. Right. Okay, so there is another plot within this film where Chloe Coleman's character, uh, I keep referring to her as the character, let's just go by Sophie is the character's name, um, knows that Dave Batista is spying on the family to keep, to keep them safe, mm. whereas the mother has no idea. Okay? Here's where you add a layer. The mother is in contact with the uncle the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's getting phone calls from him, and he's saying, I'll be there soon. You better, you better have the place safe. And don't let my brother down. And that, this sort of stuff. You add it in and there's a danger that she's facing that no one else knows about. Yeah. So both, both the mother and daughter have their own secrets from each other. Mm. So when he turns up, there's, there's already a sense of menace and dread that she's feeling that you as the audience, as the surrogate, feel. And that, that, I think that's a better way of delivering it. Yeah. I mean, they want the reveal of where the plans are. Which is the dog's collar, which I, I didn't I didn't really think worked because well, I didn't get it. I didn't get what it was at first until he like booted it up on the laptop. Also, I change my dog's collar every like month or two. And the movie, if it wants to dangle a mystery over you, doesn't work because it's not like I was spending the whole movie trying to figure out where the plans were. I never really thought about it. No. It wasn't asking you to. No. So yeah, even a case where it's like the mom's in contact and is like, I will give you whatever uh, the family statue or something like that don't worry i'll get it for you like i know where it is i'll find it yeah don't don't come here i'll I'll send it to you yeah 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 don't don't harm my daughter and he and he calls and goes like i know your daughter goes to blah 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 elementary i've been watching her and you're like oh okay this is sinister yeah yeah and have the mom be kind of secretive from dave bautista mm-hmm. and find it out slowly that would work um better because it's just 
anything to do with the villain, I just at a certain point was like, what's the point? Like, why are we why are we even wasting time with this? Well, you need something to to top off the film. You need a set piece. That's why they they get there. Yeah. Um, but it would feel more earned if you cared. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which you don't. And I want to add in terms of that set piece sort of letting the side down a little bit. This film relies on CG a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I mean, you know, 18 million modest budget. Yep. I'm not going to I'm not going to dunk on it too much, but I would sooner they don't do something instead of trying to do it digitally badly. Are you talking about the villain death at the end? The villain death, there's also a lot of like face swapping Batista's face onto people. Oh yeah, yeah. Um and like a lot of like the background's very blurry. Uh mm-hmm. and and like drop-in shots with like plates in the background where they insert like the background of things um and if you're not if you're gonna do that do it well or you know make it possible and this film doesn't do any of that and that, that's it's the visual stuff for me that really pushes me out of a film when i see cg like that and i just think there are practical ways to achieve this that might seem longer but in the end are worth it like the 18 million dollar budget is going to speak to the quality of the cg there but yeah the, i will say like the villain death it didn't look good but i was impressed at how over the top his his death was in yeah. a kid's film Sure. I mean, you don't see anything. You just get pulled off the side of a cliff. I mean, who puts a cliff at the end of a runway? They And they make that joke. But, like, you actually see him plummeting into the fiery explosion. And I was mm-hmm. like, huh. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I just I, I just think, like, it's a, it's a weird situation with the villain. I think yeah, I, I, people don't go into these films for the villain. I don't necessarily think. I mean, you want a memorable villain. Look at the Spy Kids films. Every one of them, regardless of how good the movie is in the Spy Kids universe, every villain has like a unique, interesting angle to them. Yeah. Sly Sly Stallone and his three clones. Yeah. Jeremy Piven's TikTok. Alan Cummings as Mr. Floop. Steve Buscemi as the professor or something or other. He wasn't the villain. He wasn't the villain of the second Uh, one. He was like a helper. I think they thought he was a villain and he wasn't a villain. Yeah, they made... uh, Was it the... um... Was it Mike Judge uh, was revealed to be the villain, I think, of the second one? Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I can't remember the fifth one, who the villain of that was. Yeah, I can't remember that either, actually. It's completely Weird. gone. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's Magnus. Um, it's, it's the guy in No Time to Die. Oh, yeah, Billy Magnuson. Billy yeah, Magnuson. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was yeah. A, yeah he, was a yeah. Tech, he was a tech whiz. That's right, yeah. 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 We got it. We did it, folks. Yay! We can end the podcast there. We're naming good kids films and bad ones when we go through the Spy Kids franchise, but... But we were, like, sh- sh- scratching our heads for the last couple of the films. Fair enough. Uh, but, like, every one of them had a villain with an angle on it. Yeah. Whereas, like, this had this was all rounded edges. For sure. Um, I, And just a shame. I feel like it's a... You know, you write your own script for these films, and you could do a lot with it. And, and I... <laughs> They could have done something to make him interesting. They just didn't. Mm-hmm. They had no interest in making him interesting, which is a shame. Yeah. Uh, any other dislikes you want to bring up? I don't think so. I mean, it just the one thing I'll say is it looks pretty, pretty low budget, and uh, it, it looks like a 2020s streaming film, even though it was intended for theatrical distribution. It looked like Cats and Dogs Three. Yeah, it had that look. I mean, it was all shot in Toronto, and it had that low budget movie shot in Canada kind of look. Yeah, it was. It was meant to be like Chicago, I think. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, and I had some, like, establishing shots of the bridges and things like that in Chicago. But, yeah, it was all shot in Toronto. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that is what it is. It was a budgetary thing. I get that. Yeah, although we say it's budgetary, and then you put on, like, a Blumhouse horror film that costs, like, $4 million and it looks way better. True. So, True. So, I don't know. Um, final notes, then, before we uh, my spy our way out of here. I've got a few things, actually. Okay. Um, there's a part where, like, Dave Bautista is mentioning catchphrases, and he says, chill out and jingle all the way to hell. Um, two pretty on-the-nose references to Arnold's Mr. Freeze performance and, of course, jingle all the way. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's not the two movies I would have thought to pay tribute to, but okay. Interesting. Well, there was no chopper to get to. That's true. That's true. Uh, if we're talking about nods in this film, then uh, there's a good nod to Spy Game. Weirdly, I think one of the writers must quite like a spy film. Okay, what's the nod to Spy Game? Okay, if you cast your mind back to Spy Game, when uh, Robert Redford is teaching Brad Pitt tradecraft, they go out to have a bite to eat or maybe a coffee. I can't quite remember, and he tells Brad Pitt to go up into someone's house 
and get on the balcony in the space of 10 minutes. Oh, right. And he's like, no problem. And then goes yes. and does it. And then the joke is in this film that Chloe Coleman uh, kid has no problem doing it at all and goes to several people's houses. So they sort of one up spy game. But it is a nice little nod. Yeah, it was like felt like a nod to that, but also Leon, the professional uh, in some ways. Where you had like Natalie Portman being trained in the ways of being an assassin. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, it had a similar kind of dynamic. Yeah, uh, far less sordid. Far less sordid. Um, uh, and but like Dave Bautista is kind of the quiet, kind of hulking guy, and mm-hmm. Jean Renault is a very quiet, kind of big guy, and then this diminutive, you know, young female aspiring agent slash assassin learning the skills. Yeah, this is this is the unreal life version of that story. <laughs> yes. Um, a few more notes I had. Sure. They take a shot at Mickey Rourke's Iron Man 2 performance. They do. At the top of this. <laughs> and I was like, how yeah. dare yeah. you? He's so much fun in that movie. I'm sorry. What's what's he say about his boyd? Is he, is he his boyd? Yeah. My boyd. My boyd. boyd. Yeah. He's great. Great. Uh, there's a scene where we have a car chase off the top where uh, Dave Bautista is, you know, outrunning bad guys and fumbling with the radio dial playing pop music. Mm-hmm. They have the same gag inspector a few years mm-hmm. previously where you have bond turning on i think it was like frank sinatra or something but dave bautista is chasing him in that sequence very true and uh another note i i wrote down uh jumping off of that uh opening sequence um with the music is before that the sort of swap and exchange feels eerily similar to the opening of die another day oh yeah 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 that's true like a diamond exchange with your spies undercover. I thought also of Mission Impossible Fallout, I think. When they're in the tunnels and they they hand over the nuke. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a lot of nods in there. Can't blame him too much for that. Go on. It was also a lot like the uh, ending of the first Red, which I don't know if you remember, but same writers. And it felt very similar to that. Where you had like Julian McMahon showing up as like a politician or something, doing what? Yeah, uh, Richard Dreyfus was there, and there was like an exchange. Sure. Yeah, it's I know it's a little fuzzy. I don't blame you for forgetting. Uh, um, but no, I mean I I I quite like some of the references in this actually. To be fair, like the spy game one really got to pop out of me. Mhm. Mhm. Um, this has another trope I can't stand. You have Ken Jong calling you know our our agent on the carpet. And showing video that is clearly footage from the movie. It's like, who filmed this? <laughs> uh, that's uh, yeah, that that's a uh, that's a classic a money-saving move that television and film likes to do. And I don't think there's any way around it apart from the fact that it was just to save money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think the last thing I had was that um, I thought the sequence where he went to like special friends day at the school mm-hmm. was, you know mildly amusing but also like the ultimate ego trip for dave bautista producer of the film and that like every mother there is absolutely in love with him it's it's a real tom cruise in the mummy right uh-huh yeah or every woman is just falling over themselves including the teacher who looked significantly younger i mean there is a there is a running joke um behind the scenes of, of wrestling that dave bautista has the uh, uh, well is um, well equipped for situations, if you know what I mean. Okay, uh, was he producing those episodes of WWE? <laughs> he was not. That was bit more of a backstage rumor that went on for many years. So much to the fact that people in interviews often get asked how big his equipment is. This is not the sort of topic you would expect to come up in a My Spy podcast, but here we are nonetheless. <laughs> it's, it's it's really not. I, I, I made sure to skim around the words and use uh, euphemisms so people can pick up on what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was a, a genuine thing. And the last thing I had, uh, you mentioned the turning on the radio and the goofy song playing. Yeah. What would be the What would be the goofiest song to hear on a spy's radio? Okay, so in this we had like um, 99 Balloons. Mm -hmm. We had the Titanic song, My Heart Will Go On. Oops, I Did It Again, I think was it. It was was a Britney song. Uh, Hit Me Baby One More Time. Hit Me Baby One More Time. Yeah. There was another one and I can't remember what it was. But, um, hmm. They were very of a time though, those. They were all like 80s and 90s pop. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and sorry, the question was... Yeah, the question was what would be like the goofiest one that would come out of your stereo, I suppose. Like, what would you be caught with your pants down with? Wait, what? <laughs> well, uh, what? okay. Don't add that. It, it was more of a euphemism again. I mean more like, um, like what's the most embarrassing... I suppose I'm getting to the root of the question. What is the most embarrassing song on your like Spotify or Apple Music or whatever you've got? There's a song that's in there that if someone hit like, listen to all the songs Cam's ever listened to and has listened to more than once, what's the one that you go back to that you're most embarrassed about? I don't know that I'm that embarrassed. Um, you shouldn't be. Uh, I'm, this is probably a really bad question. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like what would be outside of the norm of what I listen to. Maybe like that song, uh, The New Radicals. I had that album back You then. Only Get What You Give. That's a great song. Yeah, I really like that song. And I had their album. So I guess maybe one Is of the... Is the album any good? I've never listened to any other song apart from that song. There's a couple songs that are that are okay. But maybe one of the deep cuts from the New Radicals album would be the uh, <laughs> song that would uh, catch people off guard. See, I mean, like for me, people, it, this is the problem with it. Oh, I got it. Oh, go, on, go, go, go. There was a song. There was a song called "Crying Like a Church on Monday." <laughs> Maybe that one on that album. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I think you just uh, added a, a tiny bit of outro music there. Well done. Yeah. Um. Well, I was just gonna go with uh because it, it it's interesting because like I've have I have a very eclectic taste in music. Like it's all over the page. Like it's everywhere, yeah. right? Like, and you know that. You know what I listen to. So if I said something like Cardi Minogue. You wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't blink. No, no, um, and that's not even a joke. Yeah, you genuinely. Yeah, that's genuinely true. Um, but what I think is actually funnier is if you like dispel like the sensibilities of other people. Like people would, I'm not saying people would observe me and go, "Oh, what a cool guy Scott is." Sure. Like I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, but like I don't know. I'm I'm pretty like. Uh, I've got like a rock thing going on about me. I wear a lot of black and stuff. People would like, if I said I listened to Metallica, people would be like, yeah, I get that. Like, it makes sense, right? If I, if I said something like, I, I, I went and saw Backstreet Boys in Vegas a few years ago. Like, I listened to Backstreet Boys. I think a lot of people would be like, huh. Like, it would really ruin the Scott illusion. Okay. Yeah. So, like, I want it that way by the Backstreet Boys. Let's go for that. Although, I think the most embarrassing song that's got the most amount of plays on my Spotify is Better the Devil You Know by Kylie Minogue. Oh, okay. That's how it starts okay. as well. Not not a bad pick. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Not a, it's, it's a good tune. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's two embarrassing songs from Cam and I. Put it on a playlist somewhere and listen to it. You might enjoy it. Hmm. Who knows? Um, but speaking of enjoying it, did we enjoy My Spy? It's so much so that it's going on the list of the best spy movies of all time, Cam? No. <laughs> no, it's not going to go on there. We put the original Spy Kids on there because I think there's a level of imagination as mm -hmm. well that that movie's just bringing. This one is not. Like, no. Imagination-wise, this movie's pretty low on the old scale. Um, but that said, like as much as I had a lot of issues with more of the filmmaking aspects and just the screenwriting aspects... Mm -hmm. um, this is nowhere near the worst kids no. spy movie we've covered, nor will it be in the bottom rungs when we get to the end of the show mm -hmm. and we've tackled so many more to come. It's totally fine, but that's the problem. It's just aiming for fine. It doesn't even feel like it's aiming for more. And so I found that frustrating because I do think this could have been better. I think I, I ultimately like this was a very easy sit. Like if you're asking us, it, you know, I've always been tempted to watch My Spy because I like Dave Batista. I'd say put it on. I don't think it yeah. is. I don't think it's uh, in any way offensive, right? Both in terms of its like presentation, or in terms of just like watching it is like, oh, I can't believe I spent an hour and a half watching that. I think it's absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it has no aspiration to go higher than fine. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So that's not knockless material. That's a no from me and a no from Cam. And as such, my spy is not making the knockless dossier on the film as complete and filed as classified. Scott, let me just say, mm. I'm a little concerned about the sequel, and I'll tell you why. Okay. It's it's 20 minutes longer. Oh, no. Don't do that, folks. Just stick to 90 minutes. Yeah. I mean, has it got a good cast to it? No, it's a bit of a downgrade in the cast. You're losing some people. Really? Yeah. You've, you've, got, some of the pro you've got some of the main ones, but... Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to have a quick observation, see who's in it. Uh... Kirsten, Kristen Scow still there. Dave Bautista, Chloe Coleman. I don't see Ken Young on the list. I think he is there further down, maybe. He probably did one day of work. Oh, there, there he is. There he is. Craig Robinson's in it. He's quite funny. Anna Faris, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few less big names. Oh, yeah, and it looks like the uh, the gay couple do make a return. 
Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, we will see where this story goes as we will be returning to the world of Dave Batista and my spy in a couple of months time. Mm -hmm. But before then, I think we have a few more missions for our listeners. Yes, we do indeed. So we are going to jump back into the comedy world next week. We are going to look at the 1943 Bob Hope film, They Got Me Covered. We previously talked about my favorite spy. It wasn't our favorite spy movie. No. But who knows? Maybe They Got Me Covered will turn us all around, and that's from 1943. That's a difference of 80 years, folks. We found this one to be a mixture of okay and funny. I wonder if Bob Hope can tickle our funny bones a little bit more, hopefully more than he did when he was in a barrel with Hedy Lamarr. <laughs> hopefully 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 mm, quite there'll be mm. plenty more of those hope puns next week don't you worry so your mission folks should you choose to accept it is to travel with us back to 1943 and take a look at they got me covered the bob hope film with us make sure you follow us discreetly on social media at spy hards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter instagram and all those other lovely places and tiktok apparently so cam can get confused about it and if you don't already, try and join us over on our Patreon. We don't talk about it too much because we don't want to burn your ears off, but we appreciate everyone who supports us over on there. It helps keep the lights on at Spy Hards HQ, and it allows Cam to obsessively rent and re-rent my spy. That's right. I mean, I can't stop. I can't stop. I have to get prepared for the Eternal City. Yeah. How else are we going to bring it to you? But, you know, it, but in a serious note, your contributions, your donations, your patronage goes towards keeping the lights on here at Spy Heart HQ, paying for the running of the show, the hosting of the website and all of that good stuff. We don't really take profit out of it. It's basically about going back into the show. So every little helps and we genuinely appreciate everyone that's joined us so far. Over a hundred bonus episodes available for you from as low of a price as I think two pounds a month. Yeah, good deal. I'd, I'd say so. I'd say so, but it, it does have my voice on it, so who knows. But until next time, folks, you'll find Cam and I indulging in some ceviche and long-range missiles. Mm -hmm.